Make sure. Okay, so we're gonna go. We're gonna start in just a moment. We're just ruffling around, as you can see. The guys from Explorer Scientific are ruffling away. Hello. So uh, yeah, just uh, hang on for one second. So we're just having minor technical issues because we haven't done one of these in I don't know how long. So it's kind of exciting. Hopefully you guys can hear me because if we don't, I'm in big trouble. So who knows if you can hear those guys either? I mean, they're not talking anyway, so it's all good. So yes. Simon. Yes. You cannot. You will not be able to see what's being streamed unless you're on the live stream itself. Uh, I, I'm on the live stream right now. You, everybody can hear you. Right, the one that we're going to push out. Oh, you guys can push out wherever you're going to push out. I'm just letting the people on our side know who are waiting to, uh, that we're going to start soon. No one's complaining that you know they can't hear me, so that's a good sign or a bad sign. I don't know which. All right, guys. Um, Stay tight, I'm going to play a video for you guys so you are entertained by something at the very least. Here we go. <laughs> I might be stating the obvious with this one, but the longer you expose your sensor, the better the image. Or so it would seem. In fact, going over a set amount of time is not always the best way to image the night sky. Before we dive headfirst into the hard part, let's understand what is happening when you're exposing the camera. All images are built up of photons striking the sensor. The photon is converted into an electrical signal, which is then sent out to its destination, ultimately your screen. The problem is, when we examine the histogram, everything is to the far left. In short, this basically means that an image is underexposed and that we need more light, right? Well, truth be told, we simply don't have more light. We can't exactly fire a flash and wait for it to return. After all, if the object in question is 1AU away, we would have to wait a little over 16 minutes for the light to bounce off the object and come back to us, assuming the light itself isn't diminished. So the obvious answer is to increase exposure time to move the histogram off of the left. Again, not so fast. Another trick a lot of astrophotographers do is to increase the gain or ISO of the camera. I state this clearly, we did not increase the sensitivity. By increasing the gain or ISO, we amplify the signal in order to get the histogram to move. Not only does it move away from the left, but it also stretches the graph outwards. There is however a trade-off. The amplification of the signal also increases the noise and in higher settings adds in more noise that wasn't there before. The biggest question has always been, where do we set this number? For users of dedicated astronomy cameras, the phrase of unity gain is often heard but misunderstood. Unity gain is when the signal from the input and output is the same level. A simple way of explaining this is, one car goes into the tunnel, one car exits. If we increase the gain, then two cars will pop out of the other end. The idea of unity gain on a camera is to achieve a result that is clean and not to introduce artificial noise. Ultimately, this works in your favor when doing post-processing. So should we set the camera to unity gain when imaging? Oddly enough, no. Each object we are looking at reacts differently. Setting one gain level for all objects will result in varying areas blowing out on one target and underexposing on another. Let's get this clear before we start. Focal ratio is not the same as aperture. Aperture for telescopes is measured by the size of the main objective, whereas focal ratio is a measurement of how the optics concentrates light. Having telescopes with lower focal ratios, or F number, results in less time to expose since more light is now concentrated onto one pixel. Again, there are interesting trade-offs that result in faster telescopes. The biggest being focusing becoming a lot harder. Those in the photographic world know this effect as depth of field and hitting focus can be tricky given that the target we generally are looking at is tiny. Another trade-off to consider is focal length is greatly reduced the faster the F number is. One last point, the amount of light can easily oversaturate the pixel resulting in large blooming stars and loss of details. Imagine building a wall out of bricks. 
Each time we place a brick on top of the other one below it, the wall slowly builds up height over time. Now imagine doing the same thing with your images. As we stack each image on top, the image is given the illusion that it becomes brighter. Stacking an image, for lack of better description, does not make the image brighter. What it really does is it sorts out what is signal and what is noise. Over a set of images, if a pixel returns the same value, then the final pixel produced will have that value. If the value is different over the data depending on the algorithm, the value of the pixel is average to produce a final image. Take a look at this image. From far away, both squares appear to be the same shades of grey. But when I zoom into it, suddenly the illusion is lost and the square on the left is actually created from black pixels and white pixels. How this relates to stacking is the white pixels represents data and the black pixels represents missing data. As we stack, the gaps are filled in to create an image that is more signal than noise, noise being the missing data. The more images you stack, the clearer the image becomes. However, don't confuse this as the image becoming brighter. Exposing the sensor to light and figuring out how long to go for is often a question that is raised. Since most people don't have the patience to sit around waiting, they employ the stacking method to believe that 10 6 second exposures is the same as 1 60 second exposure. That simply is not true. The longer we expose the sensor, the more chance of a photon strike. If you do not see anything from a single exposure, the chances are that by stretching the histogram to the extreme will result in a very pale grey box, with little to no detail of what it is that you are taking a picture of. The more you expose, the more data you collect. In order to get a good image, you have to consider all of the above. Knowing the type of target that you are shooting will help determine the best course of action when it comes to settings. Every camera reacts differently to exposure, so finding the right point, much like Unity Gain, is something you need to look into. You might have heard the phrase quantum efficiency. The higher this number, the better. But don't get hung up on this number, as it's only a reference point as to how long you need to expose. If your quantum efficiency is lower than your friend's camera, simply expose longer. You have to experiment with your setup. The Orion Nebula easily blows out compared to the Eagle, which requires longer exposures to achieve the same results. Each astronomical object has its own defined surface brightness that will help you determine what exposure lengths you are aiming for. In some cases, too much light is a bad thing, and we utilize different settings to suit your desired situation. The important part is to know your setup. It's not often that you come across someone with identical setups, and even if you do, the location of where they are will be different, not including nightly seeing conditions. The key part is not to be stuck with one size fits all, but to try different settings that suit your situation. Don't expect high detail close-ups of images of your favourite nebula with a fast, short focal length scope. There is a bigger picture, it's just down to you how small you want it. Let's be honest, you've googled, crawled hours of forums and even digested miles worth of video content on how to make your guiding graph flatter than a sheet of paper in a printing press. What you might not realise, those lines and bars mean something more than bad guiding. First of all, ask yourself the question, 
Do your stars come out round? Are they streaking? Are there little weird L shapes or some other random thing occurring? Chances are your constant tweaking has probably introduced more error into the system than you thought. One of the most tempting things we as humans can do is to press a button not knowing what it does. Just because someone else presses it doesn't mean you have to as well. Let's take a closer look at what's going on before you touch that dial. The first thing you need to do is know your setup. Are you using an off-axis guider or a guide scope? What focal length is your guide scope? Pixel size of the camera? The reason you need to know this is the information needs to be plugged in before PhD has a chance of getting you any results. When properly filled out, the PhD2 wizard automatically sets all the parameters for you, meaning that you do not need to adjust any other settings. In fact, by default, PhD2 when first installed doesn't even show anything other than connect, select, etc. Oftentimes, I see people playing with settings such as hysteresis. This particular setting only tells PhD how long to sample for each data set. In other words, for every 10 steps, a measurement is made and the movement amount adjusted accordingly. By changing this number, you either make each measurement take far too long to make a calculation or you overwhelm it by constantly resampling the data collected. Also, hysteresis requires time. Don't just turn on guiding and expect instant results or complain after 10 seconds that your guiding is off. Chances are, if you have a two second exposure, you haven't even given it a chance to work anything out. Another common number people play with is the minimum movement. Changing this number much Mute. All right, guys, um, real quick for you guys watching on our stream, um, yeah. we have literally just gotten started. So we've got Scott Roberts over there and his little side there. And he, we are doing our usual simultaneous broadcast on your stream and our stream. We're more like a BTS, but it's okay for you guys to just, you know, be a part of all of this. All right, so sorry. What was that question again, Scott? My mistake. The question was, okay, we've got our two kind of opening price point mounts here from the PMC-8 line. We have the IXS-100, which is an equatorial tracker, something for small lightweight telescopes, okay? And then we've got the, IX, or the XOS-2 with PMC-8, okay? That's a, a heavier, medium-duty type of mount. Uh, and so my question was, is how, uh, you know, with, with the clientele that's buying these kinds of mounts at, um, at Woodland Hills, where do you see people uh, mostly going towards? Is it, uh, do they already have uh, a mount or a telescope that they want to uh, start using on a go-to system? Are they, are they starting off like nightscape photography? What, what's the trend right now? Um, I think what a lot of the trend has gone into is a lot of people want to be able to do tracking of some description regardless of which mount that they're looking at. And in fact, most of them uh, um, don't know about tracking mounts. They know that the stars obviously move. And the general consensus is, is I want something that can follow the general movement. Some people will actually come in and say, no, I want one of these or one of these or one of these. So I, I think people don't necessarily think telescopes right off the bat, unless they're getting something really big. But for most of the people that want to get into it, they're thinking tracking, Milky Way shots, maybe longer focal lengths with, you know, just their cameras, basically, DSLR, mirrorless, that kind of stuff. So, it would be, so the, obviously both mounts can do this, uh, but uh, the IXOS 100 was really kind of uh, geared towards that, you know, because uh, it's, it's lightweight. Um, it is, uh, uh, we already have the accessories uh, built on uh, to accept a camera when you add on the, uh, you know, the dovetail assembly. Uh, if you want some more refined adjustment, we have an azimuth adjuster. Uh, we have a heavier duty mount in, in case you want that. I mean, when I say mount, I mean a tripod assembly. Uh, but as it stands right there, at, uh, what is it, what, 15 pounds? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's 15 pounds. For astrophotography, it's nine. Yeah, that, that's so, payload. Yeah, that's, that's payload. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of the weight. The weight's 15. 15. Yeah, yeah. So you got something that's pretty small. You can travel with it. You can go chasing clips with it. Uh, you know, and uh, this this not only has GoTo and all the power of the PMC8 GoTo uh, system, 
but uh, it also has an auto guider for it on, so you can, you can auto guide with it. And I think that that's that's kind of where we start to separate it away from other equatorial tracking type of mounts. Also, uh, there's really nothing else to buy. Okay, uh, although you could buy other accessories, you could pull it right out of the box, get a, some way to attach your camera onto the mount itself, whether you're buying our dovetail or some aftermarket dovetail, and um, and start shooting. So here's an interesting thing that I notice about the uh, iXOS 100. I, um, when I first saw that mount, I didn't realize how small it actually was because I was thinking in my head um, the, uh, the GT version was the first one that I kind of experienced. And then when the, uh, the 100 showed up, I was like, damn, this thing is a lot smaller than I thought. And I had this, you know, this impulse to go up to it and pick it up. And I was like, is this all this thing weighs? I didn't realize I'd ruined the guy's polar alignment, so you know, apologize for that guy. <laughs> but I was like, this is ridiculous how small it was. And um, show, can you show somebody, uh, like, because you're standing right in front of it, you could pick it up almost with one hand from what I can tell. Yeah. yeah, and it just, I mean, the counterweight obviously is what weighs something, but you can see it doesn't, it's just so simple. You could just pick it up and just run off with it. Well, hopefully people aren't stealing yeah, anything. I, I mean, Tyler's also picking up this uh, lithium ion battery. Uh, so when you get the IXOS 100 mount, you're gonna, of course, it's complete. You got a tripod, you got counterweights, um, uh, you've got a, a battery pack that takes normal batteries, okay? But uh, the, the holder, which uh, you can't see very it's easily, but there, there's the holder, okay? Uh, also holds more scientific ion battery. Um, the, uh, you know, you have all the cables and everything else that you need. Adjustments uh, to the mount. Uh, it has a kind of a twist lock. Kind of uh, like the Right, it's very similar to the Lost Mandy type of system where you've got, you can clutch it so that you can uh, get some tightness to it, but you can still move it by hand if you like, okay? Uh, or you can get it, you can just nail it down. And so those, those adjustments are on both sides. A lot of small equatorial mounts have like little levers that you've got to go find in the dark or whatever, and uh, and that makes it a little bit tough. These quick twist knobs are easy to find um, and uh, easy to make tight if you like. Cool. Uh, I'm just going to show people uh, on the live stream a picture of what this thing looks like. So okay. there she is. So you can guys get an idea of what the actual mount looks like. It's pretty straightforward. And, and you know what the funniest thing is, is um, I was in the store yesterday and we were all messing around with one of the mounts and it just happened to be this actual mount. Um, in the corner, I had picked up a, uh, a battery pack made out of AA batteries. So you know, you've got those weird things with the bunches of AA batteries. And I said, you guys wanna see something really funny. So we go up to the mount, plug it in with the PMCA, everything, turn everything on. And we put something on there and started moving it. And I said, like, all this is powered with AA batteries. And the guy was like going, well, that's actually pretty damn good. So tell me a little bit about the powering of this mount. It's, it's like, the, you know, the guy was flabbergasted to see it. So uh, Jerry, we'll get Jerry Hubble to come on this program in a couple of minutes. But Jerry... There, good timing. There he comes. Okay. <laughs> we worked really hard on the power management of it. When we were testing it, uh, Jerry was showing me running... PMC8 uh, uh, with a nine volt transistor battery, okay? And so he was trying to make it run with a nine volt, okay? Uh, and yeah. it did in fact work, uh, but uh, not for a very long time. Now, I don't know, Jerry, uh, we were talking about the power management. Uh, by the way, this is Jerry Hubble, uh, who is the developer of the PMC8 system. And, uh, um, but early on, uh, uh, Jerry was trying, we were just trying to make this thing run off the least amount of battery power as possible. And, uh, right. how long did you make it run with a 9 volt battery, Jerry? Well, I'm trying to recall, it, the, the problem was getting the voltage high enough. Now, we could, we could actually put two 9 volt batteries in to boost the voltage up. Yeah. Um, I remember you, you made it run for like, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. Well, it was, yeah, it would run for a while. I mean, I've got to look and see what the capacity of the battery is, but it would probably run for a couple hours at least, I would imagine. Probably more than that, even. Uh, the problem was getting the, the, 
the voltage up. You know, right now we require 12 volts uh, because of the way I run the uh, motor motors and the driver voltage. But it could run at reduced capacity. I'd have to I'd have to change the regulators out because they're they're 10 volt regulators to run the motor. So that's that's to get a little by too much detail, but that's the way they run they work. As I like to call it. So, uh, so as it stands right now with uh, uh, one of our lithium-ion batteries and stuff, uh, you know, I've run uh, these mounts, if, all three of the mounts that we're going to show you. I've run them all for a weekend, okay, uh, uh, stargazing weekends without having to change batteries, which is nice. Um, uh, I can so tell you how much uh, power they actually use it. So on my bench. When it's running and slewing, it runs. It runs uses about uh, six to eight watts of power. How much is that in amperage? So it's equal to about six hundred milliamp. <laughs> That's slewing or just running? Yeah, slewing six hundred oh, wow. to seven hundred, seven hundred milliamps probably. That, that sounds like nothing basically. Yeah, so I don't know what the capacity of our lithium battery is, but uh, eight. I would say eight, uh, eight, eight, eight watts uh, for eight. So an hour would be eight, eight uh, watt hours, basically. I don't know what some batteries give you fifty watt hours, maybe or thirty watt hours. So you can get an idea. You know, thirty divided by eight. You know, that's uh, about uh, you know four, four hours. No, that's four hours for that for thirty watt hours. Four hours of tri driving, maybe. But 30 watt hours is nothing. No, literally nothing. Yeah, so, um, so you know, you're sipping on the battery, uh, and that's nice. Um, you are, you know, I, I remember the days where I would take a, a deep cycle marine battery out, you know, with my, you know, my other, you know, another brand when I worked for another company. Uh, their go-to telescope, and it actually would use quite a bit of power, you know. So, uh, so I, w I was carrying these super heavy 12-volt batteries and the alligator clips and all the rest of it to be out in the desert uh, to make sure I had enough power to. Yeah, you know, there's several hundred. There's several hundred watt hours. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and what else can I say about it? You know, the other thing I'll talk about is that uh, the. The, the telescope or the, the mount is driven with stepper motors. This is true on all the TMC systems that we have. So we're using uh, a, uh, you know, a stepper drive system. And one of the dangers that can happen with any kind of go-to mount is that uh, you can get something called cord wrap, where you're, you know, you're, you're slewing here, you're slewing there, and a cable gets caught up, and now it starts to lined up the mount, and if you're not at the telescope to watch this and unwrap it, okay, uh, if it was a system running on DC servo motors, those DC servos can uh, burn up driver chips, they can burn up electronics, it can harm the gear, uh, not the gearing, but uh, the motor itself. Uh, and so a lot of go-to systems that are out there, uh, once you do that, you're, you're replacing motors, you're probably replacing uh, uh, motherboards and all the rest of it. Uh, if this thing is cord wrapped, what will happen is, is you'll hear this really strange kind of resistance sound coming from the stepper motor itself. But, but nothing's heating up, no driver trips are going to blow, okay, no motors are going to fail, okay, and it could this could happen all, all night long. And um, you know, so you got some reliability uh, knowing that if, even if you had a emergency situation like your port wrap or the telescope to hit the side of your observatory wall or something, uh, that you're not going to damage things, okay? And that, that's nice. Plus, the stepper motors are really, really quiet. I mean, this thing sounds like a fine sewing machine when it's running, you know? Uh, uh, so I really love that sound. And um, as opposed to maybe like kind of a more coffee grinder kind of sound that was that. That a lot of uh, go-to mounts have, um, and what else can I say? The the, the drives are belt-driven, so you've got very nice precision drives. We have customers that report back to us um, uh, that they can take uh, anywhere from thirty-second to 
even some guys making three and four minute unguided shots, okay, uh, with, with the drives as they are. With an auto guider, we have guys driving the system down to about, I mean, sub arc second. We have one guy reported about 0.3 arc second tracking. What? So, no way. <laughs> okay, on this little guy right here. <laughs> so uh, that, you know, that sells at the price it does. So it's a, it's a high performance mount. Uh, we also have a, we have a, a, a load capacity that we recommend for astrophotographers at nine pounds, but we have people that put four, four inch apos on it with guide scopes, with all kinds of stuff, and they go way past this nine pounds. So uh, again, if you were to push it and use too much weight on it, uh, where it couldn't drive it anymore. It's not going to burn up the motors. It's not going to burn up the electronics, okay? You just need to back off on, on your weight. Uh, so we wouldn't recommend like putting an 8-inch Newtonian on it or a 6-inch Apo on it or anything like that. That's like something that I would do. <laughs> Although I do have, I would say there's one thing. Uh, you're, you're just pushing the limits there, Simon. These, the system... To, to tell you how we designed this system, this, this system uses the same motors as in the larger Exos 2 mount PMC-8. Yes. So it's got lots, so it's, of, lots so it's of... got the capacity. Yeah, lots of torque capacity on it, so... Um, so uh, sorry to interrupt you, Scott. So I got a question right off the bat because I know we've got a lot to move on to. Um, what is it like connecting that mount with, say, uh, some kind of Raspberry Pi uh, a PC or a laptop or anything that's, you know, one of those devices. I don't, you know, it's like an ASI Air, I guess. A lot of people are using like the ASI Air. Um, uh, they're using other things where, you know, onboard computers, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to let Jerry answer this question. So we do have, we use, we do have a standard ASCOM driver for our mount for the PMC-8. That's all, always been included with it. We've also have a community of developers called the open go to community that's that's really stepped up and developed quite a few tools over the last three four years one of the early ones was uh michael fulbright one of our customers and a good friend developed the indie driver for the pmc8 early on and that's what's included in the asi air um as part of the indie platform so it's been incorporated into the indie platform for several years now so that's available and of course, Indy runs on Linux and on the Mac OS. If you use Mac OS for your system, then then the Indy driver is available for that. But so we use industry standard interfaces to talk to the PMC. We also have our open source command language that's available. With the uh, when you download the driver, you get the program, the reference manual that includes all the details. And uh, what else do you want to say about that, Scott? Well, I mean, it's really one of the most versatile uh, uh, go-to platforms out there. I mean, no matter if you want a, a, a Linux operating system, uh, you've got all that. Plus, I mean, for beginners, we, we, uh, we typically recommend that they just go ahead and download the, um, you know, the uh, application called Explore Stars and run it off of either an Android tablet or a iPad, okay? And uh, you want to demonstrate that? Sure. All right. That. Let's let Tyler do Scott's something. Scott's taking over the show. Someone do something. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so it, it's very simple, Simon. It, it really is. Uh, so I'm going to take my lithium ion battery. I'm literally just going to turn it on. I don't know if you can see the tablet. But I'm going to just power it up. Do you want to see if you can move that light out of the way so it's not in the middle? Gary, you were able to connect to a tablet and show what the display looks like. Can you still do that? Yeah. Tyler, can you move so that your the lamp pole is in the way? I think Simon said something about move forward or back, maybe. Yeah, if you can move the light out of the way at the very least. Hold that, Simon. Uh, yep. Okay, that's good. Okay. So I'm going to point around like this. So we got the mount turned on now, and I'm in my Wi-Fi settings. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to connect to the PMC8, which I've already entered the password, which it's literally capital PMC dash capital E for paint. And once it hooks up and you download the Explore Stars, I'm going to open up Explore Stars here, which this is the whole main menu that you will see. 
is we've got a compass rose over here on the left. We have our coordinates that we have here. We know that we're parked because my deck's at 90, but right now we're just going to hit menu and go to catalog. We got a, an enormous catalog database here. Um, Jerry will have to go over the specifics on how much is in here, but it is quite a bit. But I'm going to hit solar or uh, planetary. We go to the sun and the database has 85,000 plus uh, objects in it. And that's, that's it. So now, now by the way, we've got counterweights on there and you can see that, that it, it's driving unbalanced. It's unbalanced and it's just moving like butter. Can you hear the noise, Simon, at all? What noise? That. <laughs> this thing will run a DSLR. I've had an, uh, I've pushed it to a 102. That's how long. That's how much I pushed this mount to. Now, like Scott said, there are customers, and I believe it's had an SCT six inch on there, and they've got some great planetary with this. Um, great. Granted, you're going to have skying conditions and all that stuff to take effect in it. Right. But that shows you what the capability of this mount can do. Well, and, and guys have done a ton of deep sky work. Now, mm -hmm. it, it's a great equatorial tracker for uh, night sky. To, you know, Milky Way stuff, oh, it's but, but how about deep sky stuff? You know, uh, was it Wade Prunty? Wade uh, Prunty did a, um, 100, 100 hours on NGC 7000. 100 hours. Granted, it took him a while, but <laughs> it was amazing the detail that the, that gentleman was able to get. Right. But just this wonderful little machine. Um, so we, we flew to the sun. Now, I know it's not correct because I'm facing it towards the camera, but say I want to park it now. I'm literally going to go back to menu. I'm going to go into settings, and down here at the bottom left, we're going to hit park. Go. So that's what? Simple. So what if people want need to make minor adjustments? So let's just say you've got some extreme focal length happening, um, and you're doing whatever it is you're doing, looking at the moon for argument's sake, mm -hmm. and you've got say like a three X Barlow, and you've already got like um, you know. Four, five, six hundred millimeter focal length, so we're effectively two thousand ish. What if I want to like pan around? Because that's probably one of the biggest things that people are concerned about. So depending on if your setup has a right angle finder or a straight through finder or a red dot, um, you have the ability to select the speeds that you want to manually move them out with the compass rows here. So we'll just say I'm a little off target. I want to hit nine. And I'm going to slew which just is a little the bit. fastest speed. Which is the fastest speed. And I'm just using it for argumentative sake so you can see the mount move. Yep. And you also have D-pads down here on the lower right. You have up, down, left, and right as well in case you, you're, not, you're not comfortable with compass rows. If some people like the normal, uh, the old guiding system back in the day. It's the up, down, left, right. Yep, yep. Uh, that's how versatile this mount is with this app. And same with serial. It's the same thing on a computer screen, just bigger. Makes it a lot easier to see. And as Jerry said, it, it's performed for, or it's standard for all ASCOM drivers. So you can use Nina, SGP, oh lordy, what else? The ASI Air. So I mean, it has virtual virtual amount of um, capabilities to use whatever you want it to use. Beautiful. And uh, you know, think of all the ASCOM compliant planetarium software that's out there. Shark okay. Cap, you have Fire Cap, you got all that stuff. Right. You know, I'm always going to challenge somebody out there to say, run this thing up with the Sky X just to see what happens. Do a bunch of T point models, the whole nine. Done. Oh, someone's done it. Someone's done it. Who? Uh, his name is George Lutch. Of course, of course, it's him. <laughs> What would be the challenge of running with Sky X? It's just a different planetary software that you can use. I use I use the Maxim DL in our observatory to run the PMC8. It'll it'll work with any ASCOM client as long as it's uh, coded correctly. I would say we've. I mean, you, there are some programs that have a little quirk to them. I know Cart De Seal had a little quirk a few years ago. Um, uh, Stellarium is a little quirky sometimes. Uh, but overall, any any uh, ASCOM client that can connect to it and run them out will run the PMC8. Okay, so and Indy and Indy too. Oh yeah, any Indy driver. Well, so, okay, so we've shown we we've talked about how you can uh, hook it up 
uh, to your desktop computer or a laptop or whatever, and we've shown how it can run wirelessly, okay? And by the way, very soon we're about to release a iPhone and Android for phone version with what's called Explore Stars 2, okay? So, um, uh, you know, and the, these, these apps are free for download and, and, uh, and all the rest of it, but uh, one of the other things you could potentially do is you can run it, you can be cabled in, okay, and have Wi-Fi turned on at the same time, so you can have a tablet, uh, you know, while you're working with your scope, uh, maybe at the scope you want to just adjust things or whatever, or find an object, and then you can set down it, you know, your mission control and, can, and drive it at the same time without really having to switch anything, okay? So that is... That is also unique, I believe, is. Very unique. Uh, with go-to mounts. Uh, usually, go-to mount, you have to set up one way, or you have to set up another way. Doing both simultaneously is not easy to do, and that's, that's something awesome. we could do uh, now right. with the MCA. Yep, that was the additional. When we released uh, an updated universal firmware, which basically we have one firmware to install for any of our mounts, but that was the... Uh, a big part of the work we did last year was to add that simultaneous communications to where you can con have two controllers basically that that smartly switch back and forth between the two and it's it's pretty much seamless for the user and that's for that's to be able to control the mount with the computer but also use your tablet if you walk out if you got your computer in your house running it and you go outside to do something you've got the explore stars connected to it you can you can maybe update the target or do whatever you want while you're out there, and it'll reflect it back onto your planetarium program on your ASCOM driver, in lot real time. Yeah, and that's totally cool. That's totally cool. So, of course, when you when you have a uh, computer, uh, you know, uh, connected to this with the cable, you also that same computer, that desktop computer, can be connected to the internet. So you could use something like TeamViewer or Zoom or Type B and C or any of these kind of uh, computer screen sharing programs. And now you've got the power of the internet to allow your telescope to be operated from anywhere in the world. You can run it, you know, from your house to the backyard, from your house to, you know, uh, Arizona or mm -hmm. some distant site or from you know, from Australia to France, for example, if you'd like. Okay, so, um, you know, heck, if the guys on the International Space Station had, uh, had the internet capability, they could operate it from there. So, uh, so a very nice system. This is technology. My gosh, when we saw computerized telescopes as amateur astronomers go visiting professional observatories and stuff, where they started to control them robotically computer control and stuff. We just, you know, it was multi-million dollar technology. And I remember talking to my friends saying, one day, amateur astronomers will be using this. And we were all thinking, yeah, if we mortgage our house or, <laughs> you know, we sell that boat or those motorcycles or whatever that, you know, my third car or whatever, I can get something. <laughs> but now we're just talking literally just a few hundred dollars to yeah. get into it. So, get into it. right, it's totally cool. So why don't we show, uh, why don't we move this mount and bring up the, uh, yep, she's a little heavier. So while you're doing that, Scott, um, one of the questions is uh, polar alignment. Um, how is the polar alignment done with a PMC-8? Okay, well, you would do a traditional polar alignment. Okay, we have a polar alignment tunnel in the, in the uh, system. If you're using our tablet and you're doing a two-star polar alignment, or two-star alignment, let me, let me just say that. If you're not on the pole, okay? The PMC-8 will know that and still find everything up in the sky and track. So let's just say that I'm on my patio, I got a tree blocking the North Star, I've got, I can't, you know, and I, I don't want to drift a line in, I don't want to do all that other stuff. As long as you can pick out a couple of stars, okay, during the two-star alignment method, it will track, okay, and find everything in the sky that you can see, okay? Uh, but if you're an astrophotographer, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can use, uh, we, we're, we're releasing a 
a free download for a 3D printable adapter for uh, the QHY Pole Master. So you got a Pole Master, stick it on there, bam, you're done. Okay. Uh, you can use, uh, we have a polar alignment viewfinder that will fit onto the IXS100, uh, and you can use that in Northern or Southern Hemisphere, no problem. Or you can go old school like me, and uh, I, I don't use a laser. I use, I, sometimes I've used a laser. Do you? It helps. Just aim it at Just the, lift right up, just so it goes straight through. Straight through. Well, there straight you go. Through. That makes it easy. See, that's another easy way to do it. Or, you know, I do I do drift alignments. I just like doing drift alignments. You know, a lot of people think that's a big pain. I think it's fun. Okay. That's how much of a nerd I am, guys. So, well, right? I, so you know, I think it's because people do not, I think it's because people don't understand what drift aligning actually is. It's, it's like a lost art is what it really is. I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. And so we, we have... Uh, on the Explore Scientific website, we actually have a step-by-step -step method how to do drift alignment. But effectively what you're doing is you're pointing the telescope uh, at a star roughly overhead, but still at zero degrees declination, okay? And you're putting in a crosshair eyepiece, and you're watching to see if the star will stay in the center of the field, not drifting north or drifting south, okay? If it drifts north or south, you make an azimuth adjustment. If you go the wrong way, you'll see the star drifting faster. If you go the right way, it's, it's slowing down or stopped, okay? And uh, once you have that, then you go to the east horizon, uh, still at zero degrees declination, about 25 degrees up above the horizon. And now you're seeing the star again just drifts north or south. And if it does, you're adjusting the altitude, okay? Uh, and you know, so you, you sneak up on it. Uh, again, if you've gone the wrong way, you see that start drifting faster. If you're on the right way, it slows down or stops. Once you have it stopped and you can test it for, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, you're drift aligned. And at this point, you got the best polar alignment possible because you're taking out all the issues of uh, any kind of flexure that your telescope system might have, um, you know, uh, and any issue. Uh, that might pop up. And there's several issues that could pop up when you're doing polar alignment. These are all addressed during drift alignment. So, um, but uh, you're, you're an astrophotographer, Simon. What, what, uh, what do you find is the most popular method of polar alignment now? In all honesty, it's gonna be that QHY Pole Master. Okay. That, that to me is by far and wide the one that everybody uses. I use, um, I personally, I use SharpCap's polar alignment function but I actually still go back in and do drift when I'm actually, if I'm setting up like rem um, just like remotely, then I don't care, you know, it's, it's fine. The guiding will take care of that. But at home, once I get my mount set up, it doesn't move. So I will do the polar alignment um, just like I would do in sharp cap, but then I will sit down with the mount and then do the drift alignment through PhD because it does have the function to do it. And it'll even tell you, hey, you're going the wrong way, stop. So it, that's the, the version that I prefer to use, at least anyway. Sure. sure. All right, well, let's move on. So let's, let's bring in the Exos 2 PMC-8, okay? Much heavier this thing. Yeah, it is heavier. It's a little heavier. <laughs> right? Woo! There she is, the okay. Exos 2 PMC-8. So all the things that we talked about with the iExos 100 and the way that it works and the stepper drives and all the rest of that are really the same. The difference is, is that you're going to see that the electronics are in a separate box, okay? So this is our, our heavy duty uh, 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 PMC-8 electronics box. You'll see that uh, we did things like use uh, DB9 cables, okay? So if you lose a cable, you've taken a trip to Australia or something, you have, or, or you're, you're out somewhere remote, okay, doing astrophotography and you forgot something like this, you can order one on Amazon. It's not a proprietary cable, okay? Uh, and so this allows you to hook up your uh, right ascension and declination drives. Uh, we have the box itself. Thanks very much. Here we go. Has a little antenna, so you got some better reach here, okay? And um, and it's really rugged. We've had people drop the box or whatever, so. Uh, yeah, I've dropped it a lot of times doing development work. <laughs> about this, Simon. Knocked it off the desk, you know. 
rolls along the floor. Wait, yours <laughs> rolls? I don't know how it rolled, but it took your dice, <laughs> chew on it, whatever. Um, but it, very, very rugged. This is professional level electronics available for amateur astronomers. So it, it, and this same box is on the Exos 2, uh, PMC 8, and the G11. Uh, we partnered with the last Mandy to develop, uh, uh, you know, to modify the G11 to accept the PMC 8 system. So if you need heavier yet um, payload capacity, uh, the G11 is kind of where we go with that. Um, but uh, what else can I say that's a little bit different here? Um, payload capacity. Oh, yeah, big difference. Big difference between the little brother and the big brother. This is as a 28 payload capacity, 28 pound payload capacity. Um, I like it. It's it's definitely another great setup that you can take, Simon, on the road. It's it's not heavy. It does come with two 10 pound counterweights, so you can put a C8 on there, possibly a C11, possibly. That's right. pushing it. Um, it depends on if you're going to do astrophotography or not. Uh, true. If you're doing vi visual work. Uh, visual is 40 pounds. We put 88 pounds That's true, in did. the showroom and you put did. that in a video, which you can watch on YouTube, okay? Uh, but um, we just kept stacking weights. In, in fact, we stacked all the weights that we had. In the showroom. They and then we were putting weights there. up on top of the telescope <laughs> and everything, just trying to see if we could actually break it uh, during our video. But uh, but it ran and, and operated well. Nothing, again, nothing broke. When you get uh, payload capacity quotes from manufacturers about equatorial mounts, really what they're talking about is the recommended payload capacity for the drive for an astrophotographer, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if you go to really too much heavy weight, you're gonna change the characteristic of the periodic error. Oh yeah, you'll start noticing a lot more of your mistakes too. <laughs> yes, you will, yes you will. But, um, uh, but as far as uh, a lot of, a lot of Customers will think, oh, well, the payload capacity is, is uh, whatever, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, whatever it is. And if I go 21 pounds, that means the drive is going to break, okay? Mm -hmm. The gears are going to be crushed. I'm going to wipe out a motor. No, that's not what that means, okay? It just means that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, the uh, mesh between the worm wheel and the worm itself will really be different, okay? Yes. Uh, because if you're adding more weight to it, and that's going to change your periodic error performance. Now, how much does it change? For a lot of our customers, they lot. don't see a change a whole lot, okay? Uh, I imagine once we threw 88 pounds on this mount here, yeah, that, yeah it would have changed a little. It would have changed more, for sure, <laughs> for sure. But anyhow, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, this is a workhorse mount. Uh, will hold a lot of different types of telescopes. It's got a Dixon uh, uh, you know, saddle, saddle plate. plate up here, and uh, so you, there's a lot of scopes that will work on it. Yes, like, including like our six-inch Apo, uh, you know, our eight-inch uh, photo Newtonian, um, you know, uh, with guide scopes and everything. So you can really get away with a lot. With this I, I recommend this film a lot. Sure, hey, Dewey, because I think of it as I mean, Scott or Simon. I know you have the the eq 8 r but for this one, I always recommend this one because it's the foundation of a house. If you have a very poor foundation, you're not going to get anywhere in this hobby, especially for astrophotography. Right. Um, so I always recommend if you have the money, get the little bit bigger heavy payload mount. That way you're saving yourself. You can always upgrade telescopes, and then when you will exceed what you're wanting to do, then, well, you'll see him here in a minute, the bigger, bigger brother. Right. Um, I call him Big Daddy. And... That's that's where that's observatory grade. That's where you're on a pier. It doesn't move, and right. you're ready to go. One thing I would say, one thing I would say, Tyler, about that though, is that you want to buy a mount that maybe a little bit more capacity to provide that margin in terms of what you buy. But our mounts provide margin, so yeah. even if you can't afford more expensive mount, like from let's say it's a eight hundred dollars or a thousand dollars up to fifteen hundred dollars, and you just can't afford it. With our mounts, you can. We have plenty of margin in there to help you, if you want to upgrade your weight. Right. I think that's part of what we're talking about there in terms of the, the investment you have in this mount. Yes, it's a big investment. It's a great investment too. Okay. So a lot of people have also asked us, especially when we were, we were developing PMC, 
What about periodic error control? Okay. Well, we didn't put a specific periodic error control system in here because folks, there's a lot more going on with drive error than just periodic error. You know, there's tooth to tooth gear error. Uh, there, I mean, Jerry uh, identified like seven or eight different types of gear error that there is. Periodic error is just one of them, okay? Uh, it is kind of a buzz uh, marketing thing saying, oh yeah, you can correct out the periodic error, but okay, now you got six more to correct, okay? So there's, there's a, a couple of ways to address this. One of them is an auto guider, of course, you know, and auto guiders came way down in price. They're very easy to use, they're easy to set up. Um, but the other thing that can be attached to this is an encoder system that gives direct real-time feedback that, that eliminates all those different uh, driver terms, and that's called the Telescope Drive Master. The Exos 2 can take a, a Telescope Drive Master, and when uh, Tyler brings over the G11, um, we'll show you where the, t the uh, Telescope Drive Master fits. Uh, uh, and Mike, this, this is the system that we're setting up uh, uh, for uh, some kids down in Brazil to operate the telescope remotely to do some astrophotography. So uh, why don't we bring that one in here and let me, let me move this. Okay. You got any questions, Simon, about the Exos 2? Um, mainly, how heavy is the damn thing? Well, with, uh, with counterweights, uh, guesstimating... 35? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's probably about uh, 65, 70 pounds total. So, in, in terms of um, portability, is it just as equally as portable as all the other mounts out there? Because I think that's the biggest thing is, is we've seen the Exos 100, which is like you're just straight up grab and go, panic, let's get the heck out of here type scenario. The G, uh, the Exos 2 GT, where does that category fit in? Or does it still fit into that category of panic, grab and go? I mean, it depends I would, on... I would play, I would, I would say that our my Exos 100 is definitely grab and go. Okay, yes. yeah, it's solidly there. I would say that this is the smaller uh, Exos 2 uh, PMC, PMC mount is what I would call a portable mount. Correct. Okay. Absolutely portable. That when you take the head off without counterweight, you know, he's lifting all these counterweights and everything on here. But without the counterweights, that head is is under 15 pounds. Yes. Okay. That tripod is about 25 pounds. Okay. Uh, you, okay, you got two 10, 10 pound counterweights, you got the box, you got uh, maybe your batteries, you know, this kind of thing. So okay, the the weight overall the package is gonna add up. But uh, uh, it is it's solid, okay. Thing is, it, it can collapse pretty easy. I think it's I think it's a little it's a little bit lighter than the EQ6, uh, you know, class oh, mount, and yeah. it almost it'll almost carry the same capacity as an EQ6. Not quite there, but it's very close. And so I think overall, as in terms of portability, it's it's as, as at least there are more portable than the other mounts that are out there in that class EQ5 class mount. I guess you could call it. The serious mount from um, Orion. Orion. Yes. How do you compare that against something like the VX mount, which is like one of the most popular mounts out there, Jerry? This is this this XS2 mount goes head to head, I think, against the AVX, and it's uh, it's got upgraded mechanical. It's got you know bearings and everything where the AVX doesn't. It's got you know our high performance control system, of course, and so in terms of Weight capacity. I'm not sure what the weight demonstrated weight capacity is of the AVX, but I, I can guarantee you that it's at least what the AVX can carry, if not more. Oh yeah, no, I think I think it's more than the VX. Yeah. Go ahead, Simon. Sorry, I was just saying it's. Uh, I think it is. Um, the weight capacity is more than what the VX does, from what I can tell. Yes, it's. I think the AVX total weight. If I'm wrong, it's been a while since I've had one. The max I could put on that one was less than 15 pounds. The ABX. Well, one of the things I noticed uh, just looking at their specs is they don't give you a spec for astrophotography and for visual. Okay, they just throw a number out there. What does it mean? I don't know. You know, so that would be 
that'd be a question I would ask them, you know, what, what does your number actually mean? Is it for visual or is it for astrophotography? I might get back an answer like, yes, yes it is. <laughs> so, but, but they really are two different numbers, okay? So, all right, so let's bring in the G11. Oh boy. Hey Scott, is there any way to move that light that's right in the middle of the frame? Stand by, Simon. He's doing it, yeah. How's that? Yes, well, there we go. That's that perfect, happen? perfect, perfect. Right there's right fine. Right. Give me a minute. Okay. Now, the Laws Mandy G11, if no one's familiar with the Laws Mandy G11, on paper. Oh, you cheated. You had it on wheels. Yeah, and he's, of course he's got a lot. I got this thing heavily modified, guys. So. <laughs> it's on wheels. It does not come on with wheels. Um, the beauty part about the Laws Mandy G11 is on paper it'll hold 60 pounds that's on paper i can i could probably guess this thing would probably hold 100 pounds easy and just keep on moving we haven't tested we've, it yet because well we've loaded here. up the observatory g11 up to 75 pounds for astrophotography and it worked fine yeah but jerry yours is also with the tdm though correct yeah, it's got the telescope drive master. It's on a solid pier, you know. Yeah. So how it's mount, but I have to say that the G11 tripod is like a rock. I mean, it's no different than a concrete pier in the ground when you get it set up correctly. It's it's, 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 it's amazing well, how solid it is once it's once it's set up. So, so I mean, if I extended the legs all the way up, the it would be as tall as me, and I'm six two. Oh, yeah. I would literally looking dead on with this camera sitting right here so it's she's a heavy girl she definitely is but the beauty part about it is the great thing about it is let me turn it real quick i love these wheels i'm glad scott did this <laughs> is you have these two clutches or release stops that are right here i don't know if you can you see these simon yep okay so with the ability with the laws mandy g11 we we've got with scott laws mandy we added the ra extension so this is semi-portable, which is great. The head, the, the deck head weighs 33 pounds. The RA weighs 33 pounds. And the tripod, I believe, is another 20-ish? Oh, it's more than that. And, well, we'll say around 30-ish. Yeah. But you can, you release these and this head will literally just come off. So it's three pieces. Now, the other thing that the RA extension does is it adds some space so that you can go through the meridian with it, okay? So you true. keep tracking uh, with it. So, and the PMC-8 PMC system allows you to track past the meridian as far as you dare to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, a lot of systems actually have hard stops uh, or software stops. I mean, that's actually a good point to raise. The PMC-8 actually has some of these things built into it, if I remember correctly. Right. Uh, you'll see that uh, we added a little shelf here. We 3D printed a shelf. On top of that shelf is a, a nut computer. Okay, so it's running. It's running Windows 10. Okay, and on Windows 10 we've got all of our software. We got our planetarium software uh, connected to the PMC boxes just down here, um, and it's got Zoom on it. And so uh, the idea here is, is that I just connect this to the internet, start a Zoom session, and let kids from this, uh, the, the first test of this is gonna be uh, a group of, called, they're called the Young Stars of Tomorrow. This is a program that Dr. Marcello Souza started uh, in, in combination with the Explore Scientific's mentor program. And uh, they're going to do science with this telescope. And uh, this is literally, be the same kind of setup that they have at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory, but I'm just running a little four inch <laughs> on here with an ED80. ED80 is a, either a wide field scope, uh, wide field astrophotography, or guide scope, and uh, and then the ED102. So, uh, but uh, I think four inches is probably about the minimum aperture that you can do uh, for uh, exoplanet uh, work, and so. And I know from direct experience that uh, um, you know that uh, the uh, Mark Slade Remote Observatory does exoplanet work day in day out. Mm -hmm. 
computer system. So a um, big question that came in right off the bat, and it's a bit more generic though. Um, should I buy a mount before I buy a camera? And I, could, so I suppose I could say the same thing as should I even buy a telescope? Which should you get first is the best question, I think. You know, this is a, this is a if you're asking me, uh, I think that you need to buy the mount first, okay? All right, but you need to already know in your mind, okay? what range of scopes you might be thinking in, okay? It, 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 here, I mean, we've got the G11 just yeah. driving a little teeny tiny four inch refractor. Okay, mm -hmm. this is like taking a sledgehammer to a thumbtack, okay? Uh, I can operate this in wind. I, you know, nothing's gonna bother this telescope while I'm, while I'm out there making astrophotographs. See, I always ask customers, what are you planning on looking at? What are you planning on doing? Do you want to do astrophotography? Do you want to do visual? Uh, are you wanting to just do planets? Or are you wanting to do deep sky objects? And I always, like I, like I said before, Simon, I always recommend the Exos 2 PMC-8 because it's a great starter beginning mount. And it can progress to a, a almost an intermediate mount, depending on the user. Because um, it's a great start. To always you know, think of it as a house. Without a great foundation, you're not going to have success. You have great foundation. You can have the tools to build upon on that platform. Um, so always look at uh, the the mount capacity is always a good thing to look at. Um, and what do you plan on putting on top of that platform? Yeah, you may have a variety. Most amateur astronomers have certainly more than one telescope. I know I know guys that have twenty or more telescopes. Okay, uh, and uh, you know if you have a larger mount. Uh, and a set of counterweights to complement it, you can, you can put all, almost all your scopes on, on it as you mm -hmm. want to use these things, okay? Um, the G11 for me is, is a you know, high precision mount uh, by itself anyways, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, just the native uh, uh, periodic error uh, uh, rating on it uh, from Las Mandy is plus or minus five arc seconds. I mean, that's right out of the box. Uh, when you're auto guiding it, uh, certainly you can get down to the uh, one arc second range. You can put a telescope drive master on here. Uh, for some reason, we, we took mine off, so they're looking at it for, for whatever reason. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the telescope drive master uh, can take it down to sub arc second tracking, almost down to zero. Yeah, pretty close. You're talking point and, two. And now you have a mount that costs. You know, yeah, granted, this mounts is forty-one hundred dollars. Right. It's 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 inexpensive. But what other mounts in the forty-one hundred dollar range can get down to almost zero periodic error or zero drive errors? Let me let me rephrase that, okay? Because uh, you know we we've got mounts like uh, this Paramount. Uh, we've got uh, got Ioptron. Yeah, I don't know. They even track. I don't think they make those kinds of claims. Uh, Ten micron is another microns. high performance mount. Uh, yeah, well, we're already talking silly money now. All the mounts you're listing uh, are all, you know, six thousand plus dollars. Exactly. That's that's true. You're when you when you're wanting the better tracking, you're gonna pay for it. You're you're honestly. I mean, what's astrophysics has a mount that's ten grand starting out. That's, the Mark II. So. But anyway, a great, I mean, those are all wonderful mounts, and if you've got the money, go for it, okay? But, but uh, uh, you could take the thousands of dollars you might owe the Y save and throw it into camera. your next camera, okay? Mm -hmm. Or your next computer system, or maybe, how about this? It's an observatory, okay? We also sell observatories. So, um, so these, are, these are other things that you need, uh, you know, to uh, make you a more productive, uh, astronomer than you might be otherwise. See, this is the thing I like about um, a lot of your products, Scott, is you, you guys aren't really basically aiming for the top echelon uh, right off the bat. You guys are looking and listening for what people actually want, and that's the part that I love the most. I mean, I remember when the, um, the GT2, or the 2GT, whichever way you want to call it, I remember when that first came out and it filled a gap in the market for us where you know, people wanted, say, the VX mount, but we didn't have anything. But they wanted something comparable. 
and I would always tell them, it's just like, this isn't a comparable mount. This can actually exceed your expectations based upon how you actually utilize it. And when that little baby, little Exos 100 showed up out of thin air, I was like, where's this been all my life? You know, so that's the thing. I love the fact that you listen to people. Well, that's, that, that, you know, we are uh, focused very much on educational outreach, getting astronomy, you know, uh, where you're going to, you're not just going to do gee whizzes at the eyepiece and it's a novelty, you know, but you might be entering into the lifestyle of astronomy and, uh, and you need the right kind of gear to get started. Uh, and, uh, you know, granted, you might, as you grow in, in your lifestyle, you may end up with the most grand observatory and the biggest telescope and the world's most expensive cameras and all of that. But we all start off, we have to learn. We have to learn how to do it. And um, uh, having a system that's flexible enough, professional enough, high precision enough to get the job done uh, is important without breaking the bank account, so. Right, that's the important part. Um, so Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're, I think Scott started the company uh, understanding that he wanted to create high value products which are basically 90 to 95 percent of the performance for half the cost basically is what the goal is right right I mean you can always pay twice or three times as much to get that last 10 to 5 percent performance increase right but most people don't need that last 10 percent they just want a very high performance scope that's not the best but it gives them high value because it costs half as much. Uh, I've taken a lot of mount out to expeditions. I've been to uh, two eclipse expeditions, the, the, the Casper Wyoming event with uh, we, uh, the Exploratorium uh, group, uh, a professional eclipse chasing team uh, out of San Francisco uh, chose us to be um, there for backup. Uh, initially at the 2017 eclipse, and guess what? One of their big mounts failed, okay? <laughs> and we were there with working G11 mount running PMC8, and we got their we got their camera on there with an H-Alpha system, and we got the eclipse live, which was uh, you know, live streamed through NASA's channels and all the rest of it. Then we were invited to Chile uh, for the 2019 eclipse, and we went to um, the uh, uh, CTIO uh, observatory complex up there, and that was amazing. And they used two of our mounts. Uh, one was a wide field, and one had a small telescope on it. But uh, uh, and that complemented a uh, kind of a more massive uh, paramount uh, that was also running a, a larger system. But uh, but we were there and we got the job done. So. Uh, question for Jerry. Um, I have an Exos 100 and it seems like only one application can communicate to it at a time. Uh, this limits my session because I use APT and PHD2 at the same time. That's a, that's a common thing. So ASCOM, uh, there's different types of uh, interfaces. The, the PMC8 has a driver. It's called a driver. It's not a server. So what you're looking for and what we recommend to people is to use uh, the POTH, which is a hub, which is the legacy uh, uh, hub device that allows you to connect multiple uh, ASCOM client programs like CART to Seal and MaxMDL simultaneously. Or you, can, or you can use a newer device hub under ASCOM to connect all your applications to the device hub and then the device hub connects to the PMC-8 and it's kind of like the, the manager that directs commands into the PMC-8 from all the different clients. So if your client, like a start, like a planetarium program is keeping track of your location on the display, that can connect up and then you can have APT, which drives it uh, maybe uh, also, or records information off of the mount con um, coordinates. It records that data, it can get that data for you any other applications you want to connect up to the uh, PMC-8 can be connected through one of these device hubs or the PAWF. That's So that's what uh, that's basically how you have to do it. Awesome. Uh, just out of curiosity, Jerry, um, do you think that you guys are going to have ASCOM Alpaca for this out of interest? Yeah, I've been studying Alpaca over the last couple of years. I'm pretty good friends with Bob Denny in the ASCOM uh, community and... Uh, 
that's just that's on my list. <laughs> As you can imagine, there's probably ten different things on my list to get done. That's that's definitely on my list to upgrade uh, the driver to uh, support Alpaca cross-platform con uh, connectivity. So yes, that's uh, that's on the radar. Let's talk a little bit about the open go to community. The, 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 soft, uh, the software and the firmware uh, that run uh, the, uh, uh, the system are contributed by a community of hundreds of, of uh, people in, that have joined up on groups.io, and they are directly driving features, directly driving performance, okay? They're creating, this community is creating the kind of go-to system that they want, okay? Uh, working in a previous company, uh, all, you know, all this stuff was super secret, patented, uh, you know, uh, and the idea was is that the company was going to tell you how to do go-to uh, uh, astronomy, you know, and, that, and that's, that was what you were left with. You had to learn their system, okay? We have not done that here, and I'm, I'm proud to say that, but it, it's really cool because uh, we are working with some really brilliant uh, uh, amateur astronomers that are slash programmers, okay, that are, that are uh, really driving and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking the system. So when we run into an issue, like any uh, programmer uh, or, or uh, supplier of uh, astronomical software does, occasionally we run into a bug or something like that. These guys, everybody just jumps on this, okay, and we take care of it right away, okay? So that's, that we've had it before. We we're running through a, a, a couple of niggles right now and we'll have in the future, but the difference is, is that the community pretty much owns this operating system and owns this, um, uh, this software, you know? God forbid, I mean, if I win the lottery and win hundreds of millions of dollars, and Scott says he wants to go to Australia to Irish Rock and go stare at the Southern Milky Way for the rest of his life. Uh, there still will be a community to support the PMC8 system, okay? And uh, you know, so it, 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 if that if that day ever came, which would be a tragedy and a wonderful thing at the same time, uh, you'll still be here. I'll still be. I know, I'll still show up for work. I'll still show up. For That's work. right. Hey, we'll look forward, you know. So yeah, we're we're working hard to build that community and to and yeah. to trans and it's a it's a work in progress for sure. But we've made good progress over the last few years in the open go to community. I want to specifically thank Wes McDonald uh, for yeah. his invaluable help over the last year or two. He's uh, now. The firmware is not open source, of course, you know, we, we guard that pretty heavily, but we brought Wes into from the open go to community to help because of his expertise and knowledge uh, to help bring these uh, firmware updates more uh, faster to the community. Like Wes, okay. Yep. So these are not employees of Explore Scientific. These are people that have joined up with us you know, to push the, the uh, performance and the reliability of the system. Okay, yep. um, I got two questions. I'm going to start with the easier one first. Technical support. Where do we go? Well, okay. <laughs> We've got one of the uh, uh, leaders of our technical support team right here with us, and that's Tyler Bowman. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Jerry Hubble also has <clears throat> done technical support. One of the cool things that, uh, in today's world is that we're able to log into people's computers remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, we have shown people how to configure their system so that it works with the PMCA. Sometimes there's people that just run into a problem and they're just batting their head against the wall and they can't figure out why and it ends up being a configuration problem where they're running something else or they, they haven't turned something off or you know, uh, Windows is doing something in the background uh, that's providing a good connection, okay? Uh, on one occasion, I remember Jerry Hubble and I were on, uh, we do a live program uh, uh, every day, and one of those programs is called the Open Go To Community. And on one of these programs, we had a guy come on the show live, could not connect, okay? He was talking with an audience member first, wasn't he? Yeah, he was an audience 
specific question. Right, right. Never so he could not do it. So he said, okay, we're going to do this live, okay? Now, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of manufacturers would not risk doing something live because probably what's going to happen if you do it live, it's just going to blow up in your face, right? So, so I said, no, we're doing it live, okay? So he gets on. And we configure and make this telescope system run live during our shuttle, okay? And uh, uh, that put a big smile on my face, you know? But, and it put a bigger smile on the customer's face, you know? But this, these are some of the things that we could do. Um, uh, we have, I, I asked recently um, uh, for Tyler and Kent Marks, who also is uh, uh, very involved in technical support, uh, to give me a rundown of our first thousand IXOS 100 mounts. I just wanted to see what the reliability was like, okay? I'll be very transparent with you. We had 36 credit memos, okay, out of a thousand. And you're going, okay, well, credit memo, what is that? Defect, something like that? No, they're, I mean, credit memos are issued to dealers and customers uh, based off of any reason for a return. And we had, um, uh, so out of that 36, we had two of them that were due to what you would call a physical problem, okay? On one of them, the customer had pushed in uh, the USB port too hard and it broke in a USB port on it, all right? Another one we had uh, where the uh, firmware. firmware was corrupted, okay? We were able to of course, fix the, the broken uh, uh, USB port, and we were able then to just go and uh, you know, delete what he had in the in the board on the other unit and reprogram it, and it was working just fine. The other 34 units we had returns because of uh, shipment damage. Uh, we had a dealer that had some overstock. It was issues like that, so. Out of out of out of a thousand right now, okay, uh, that that I had them do this analysis of actual real defects where you just going right out of the box, DOA doesn't work, zero, zero, okay. So that's that is an a, a really a almost impossible level defect level to maintain. I can't. I'm not going to guarantee I can do that forever, uh, but. Uh, you know, out of a thousand units to have zero, uh, and after working in this industry, not only for my company, but for other companies as well, I would say that zero is phenomenal. <laughs> so I was really, really happy about that. Yeah, that was, so that was the primary, that was the number one goal that Scott had for this product when we, he came to me back eight years ago now to design the system is he, number one reliability was, was foremost. That's why you see that big box on the first uh, edition of the PMC-8 well, that's on the G11 and the XOS2 because it was all it's all about reliability and uh, so right. that that's that's why we designed it that way and then we were able to push down that technology and be I'm, I'm surprised at that reliability level also but that talks to you about not not the work that I've done but in terms of the work we do in our manufacturing plant to create a quality product and deliver it uh, because the manufacturing and getting the correct components is, uh, is a large part of that which I did have it, something to do with but uh, mill spec parts conformal coatings you know all kinds of things in terms of making the thing work and work all the time is right. a big deal it's a big deal to Scott and to me um, and you, Jerry you'll even remember when, it, when we first started I wanted to have uh, waterproof Actions, okay, and I, the way I was going to, to right. show this thing underwater running, okay, um, but uh, we found out that each under you know waterproof connection was going to raise the overall price of the PMC by like way too much money. Okay? Yeah, the connectors are expensive. Very, very expensive. You know, the, even, the original design of the box also had an O-ring on the cover plate, and we do have that. So this is really designed. This box is, and, and the embedded IXOS 100, these electronics are designed to be working outdoors. They can get wet a little bit? Yes, they can get wet a little bit. So humidity is not gonna really be a problem. You know, I expect uh, uh, that these 
uh, electronics are going to work for 15, 20 years, no problems. I can tell you, I've had the uh, I've on. had the PM I've had the PMC8 at the observatory running for the last four years on all the time, except hours. for outages. It's been not powered up the whole time. Right. So. Um, Let's do this last question real fast. Um, uh, anybody could just pitch into this uh, question. And I like this for a reason. Uh, where should I start it from? Okay. Would you ever recommend go to telescopes for absolute beginners? Sure. Why not? Uh, now, what I would not recommend is the go to system where you could not release the locks of the mount and operate it manually. Okay, for a beginner. You know, if you are building up an observatory station and uh, you, you know everything is going to be computerized, yeah, okay, choose a, a, a go to mount that only runs when it's got power. Fine, okay. But if you're a beginner, all right, and you don't want to hook up the computers and you don't want to do anything, you just want to grab it, haul it outside, go see Comet Leonard or something, you're going to be out there five, ten minutes. Yeah, you want a system that you can release the locks, move it, adjust it manually by hand. Okay, fine. If you don't want to use all the, uh, if you think it's cheating or cheating the, your, yourself out of learning the sky, you can still use the, the mount as a regular tracking mount. The PMC-8, if you don't have anything hooked up to it, okay, but you just turn it on, just drives and right ascension. Yeah, that's a feature that we added with this latest firmware is that you can uh, track on boot, basically, where you don't have to communicate with a computer at all. It, it acts like a, a legacy mount, like a traditional mount back in the 60s, 70s. Yeah. It just drives, and you can move it around manually to point to any object in the sky and tighten the clutch, and you right. can look at whatever you want. What you want. Right, but you're running with stepper drives that are really quiet, like the old AC synchronous motors are really quiet, you know. But you're running off of batteries, and it's just super easy. And then challenge yourself all night long. Do the Messier Marathon. Do, you know, go after the uh, Herschel list. You know, all these things. Uh, you know, star hop, use setting circles, whatever. Okay. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I would recommend it. And then when you want to do something like, uh, you know, go through a list of 200 galaxies to search for supernova really does help to have a go-to system, okay? Because you can concentrate then on your research and getting data rather than going, okay, do I remember how to find NGC 891, okay? Uh, and pulling out the star charts and all the rest of it. You can build a script, go after all this stuff. It'd be, so you can be as rudimentary, as organic astronomy as you want with the PMC 8 mounts that we have, okay? Or you can go as advanced as you want to. For, you know, including full remote, fully scripted, fully absent uh, type of astronomy, you know, where you wake up in the morning and you'll load the data. Oh, who's that creeping in again? Oh, hey! No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, ooh, sorry, just knocked something over. Okay, Scott, right. thank you very much for doing this. Um, and like I said to everybody who's watching the stream, uh, this is more like a, I kind of just like butted into what Scott was doing for his like just general day to day thing and said, hey, do you mind if we slide in and do something like that? So excuse the crudity of how all of this is. Uh, but thank you very much for coming on, Tyler. Thank you, Jerry, for making the appearance. And of course, the trash guy that has to drive past in his truck right now. Thank you. Yeah, go away. OK, and so, there's so much noise here streaming on to I know you're streaming to your audience uh, Simon we're also streaming to the for scientific audience I couldn't be on chat like I normally am okay so all of you guys that are watching right now thanks very much for tuning in and uh, you know keep looking up we have uh, we have more programming coming up and uh, we'll do more with Woodland Hills in the future so just say just say the word Simon and we'll do it okay Oh yeah, don't worry. We will. We'll. Well, you know, I come onto your live stream at night anyway, oh, just randomly. Yeah. Actually, uh, before we run away, actually, uh, just quick, uh, quick chat about that because I, I think a lot of people who look at our live stream doesn't necessarily know about the Explorer Alliance Live. Yeah, Explorer Alliance Live. Uh, we are actually we do a live program every Monday through Friday. Uh, 
Uh, we occasionally do uh, uh, special programs, like where we have uh, uh, we have scientists on from like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and stuff. We had Alan Stern from New Horizons uh, come on uh, with us. We had uh, Dr. Rosalie uh, Lopez, you know, from uh, JPL NASA, that interviewed. Um, what's being called the world's youngest research astronomer, which is uh, uh, Nicolina. She's eight years old and she, uh, she's down in Brazil. She's doing asteroid research. She has given lectures and interacts with NASA scientists and all the rest of it. Really sweet uh, little girl, uh, but really smart, okay? And so that's really cool. Um, and those are called the Explore Now series. And they just kind of come up uh, as we can put them together. On Tuesdays, typically on Tuesday nights, starting about six o'clock central, we have something called Global Star Party. I started Global Star Party because we were all locked down in the pandemic, couldn't go to real star parties. So I said, God, wouldn't it be fun to get my friends from around the United States? And then I thought, okay, around the world and, uh, and to share live views through their telescopes to uh, you know, talk about what's going on in their, their corner of the world, okay? And so we have done 70, 76 global star 76. parties. Today will be the 77th global star party. And uh, they start at 6 p.m. Central, a lot of times going to like 10, 11, 12, 1. Five, 3. <laughs> really late. Yeah, I've so, seen a few of those late ones too. <laughs> And we, and we literally reach around the world. We have uh, we have astronomers sometimes chiming in from Australia, Asia, uh, uh, the, the UK. Uh, uh, we have a contingent from Argentina that's on almost every time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Simon Tang, of course, uh, comes on as well. So we'll have nighttime uh, uh, astronomy, live imaging sometimes of galaxies and stuff. And Simon will come on with a live image of the sun. So. Uh, there's no other way to have a global star party except to do it in a virtual way, okay? And so uh, uh, for those of you that might be watching, you go, that, that sounds like fun. I'd like to participate. Just get in touch with us uh, at Explore Scientific. You can call customer service, and uh, they'll get you hooked up. And uh, we try to keep those presentations short. Now, that's not always possible, but we try to keep them short down to about 10, 15 minutes max. And... Uh, you know, so it's bite-sized astronomy, but you're showing the world uh, your passion, your knowledge, okay, your interests, and uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, an important message about uh, you know, protecting dark skies, you know, forming uh, astronomy clubs or whatever, because astronomy is good for you, and uh, and so it's I think it's gotten a lot of people through this uh, pandemic that uh, might have otherwise just kind of lost their minds that they couldn't go out and interact with other amateur astronomers as they are yeah you know i got um i gotta say i think a lot of people in the astronomy community as well as the vendors i have never seen anybody get together during the pandemic as as much as we did because we all did live streams i mean i think we just lived off of there for a, a while and it was great to have that link with everybody again and that was the scary part. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, what's going to happen? It's just going to be me in a dark field on my own inside of a plastic bubble, not trying to catch COVID, you know? <laughs> so we had people uh, during Global Star Parties that were just setting up like their tablet, running Global Star Party, okay, watching on YouTube. We are simulcasting, okay? And Simon's done this with yep. me and just a lot of tricks, by the way, which I really appreciate. Simon. He's a real pro. Uh, but uh, they'll set up their telescope in their backyard doing astrophotography or whatever, and then hear the banter of Global Star Party in the background. So they, they're kind of simulating actually being at a real in-person <laughs> star party, you know, so that's, that's pretty fun. But that's the thing, it's more exciting. I think uh, one of the things that I remember was when I set up the C-14 and we had uh, Jupiter, uh, and I had right. to butt in constantly because it's like, oh my God, we've got good seeing, you know, and oh, we would see that clear image right yeah and he was broadcasting it around the world so a lot of fun but Woodland Hills has also done a lot of this themselves and they have uh, participated at trade shows where they were there virtually and they really know how to bring their game on and uh, you know a lot of that technology again I'll tribute to Simon because he knows how to pull it off so 
Good job. Cool. Really good. All right. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Um, if you have any other questions for either myself, Scott, or whoever, uh, you can find us on telescopes.net or explorescientificusa.com. Is that right? Okay, yep. And then we can... And then, uh, you know, uh, you can go straight to uh, the link that we, uh, that we published on our live streams, okay? And it'll take you right to the Explore Scientific store at Woodland Hills. Or otherwise, just go to telescopes.net and uh, and you can, uh, you can find our stuff and, and scats of other uh, products, uh, including cameras, eyepieces, other mounts, other brands, and stuff like that. The time to get into amateur, amateur astronomy is now. Okay, we are living in the golden age of astronomy. We're about to launch the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's about to change everything we know about astronomy. Okay, so. It's going to be a cool, uh, a cool time. So, cool, uh, guys. Uh, if we don't see you again, uh, on, if we don't do another Woodland Hill stream, you guys have a great holiday. Uh, if you have questions, of course, get in touch with us. If you find our lines busy, it's because we're crazy busy right now. So, but uh, That's the same, uh, I could say the same for everything for us. Even we're in the same boat, so it's all good. Everybody, all right, everybody on the live stream. Good night. God bless, and I will see you.